Well, even if Australia and the rest of the world meet their stated targets to cut emissions, will it be enough to save the planet? Leading climate scientists meeting in Melbourne have been arguing their contention that even if every commitment made so far is honoured, the world will still be four degrees hotter by the end of the century. Joining us to discuss what that means, I was joined a short time ago by a leading expert on climate change, a director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research and a key advisor to the German government, Professor Hans Joachim Schellenhuber. Hans Joachim, Shellen Huber, welcome to Late Line. Why are we talking about a world that's four degrees hotter by the end of the century? Wasn't the agreed goal at both Copenhagen and also Cancun to limit the global warming to two degrees? And isn't the world step by step taking action? Hmm. It's true that we have politically an agreement uh, among 194 countries but we should limit global warming to less than two degrees in general, not just till the end of the century, but for all times, if you like. Unfortunately, political reality of climate diplomacy is uh, telling us that we are on the wrong track right now. We are heading for a world which will warm up by three or four degrees by the end of the century. But even worse is in store if you go beyond 2100 we might have, on current course, so to speak, a warming of 6 to 8 degrees by the year 2300. And that would be a completely different world. And are, are these projections based on uh, governments and, and countries only doing what they've said they'll do now? Do they factor in mm. new technologies? Do they factor in increased mm. commitments? No, actually, this is the business as usual. Um, scenario, including the pledges made by various countries after Copenhagen, actually, after Cancun. So we have a number of announcements from various countries where we'll do something about climate policy. For example, Germany has planned to reduce carbon emissions by 40 percent by the year 2020 and actually compared to the 1990 level. So I understand that's much more uh, than Australia is planning to do. But if you factor all these things in and you assume, yes, there will be some type of innovation, the thing you alluded to, and we are still left with this tremendous amount of warming by the end of the century and even worse beyond that. So, so what does a 4% hotter world or 4 degree a four hotter, world hotter world look uh, like? Yeah, I mean, people often say, well... I have fluctuations of temperatures between, say, Queensland and Melbourne or whatever uh, at a much higher level, so why should we care about it? Uh, you have to compare, compare it actually to body temperature. Our body temperature is about 37 degrees. If you increase it by 2 degrees, 39, you have fever. If you add 4 degrees, it's 41, you are dead, more or less. Uh, and you have to think about that as the body temperature of our planet which has been uh, brought about through many, many processes over many, many millions of years. So perturbing, disturbing our planet at such an amount, with such an amount, would, as I said before, create a different world. It would mean agriculture would have to find completely new ways. And by the way, Australia, surrounded by oceans, four degrees sustained for a while would mean at least seven or ten meet the sea level rise, probably it would melt down all the ice on this planet that accounts to 70 metres, 70 metres in the long term. And populations? I mean, what sort of a population could that sort of world support? Uh, that is a question I'm not really able to answer, but uh, uh, let me turn it around. If we assume we have 10 billion people on this planet, by the year 2100, uh, we cannot imagine that under unbridled global warming they could all lead a decent life. But they could all exist? You can exist on almost nothing, actually. Uh, but, you know, in the end it's about human dignity, I think. Uh, and uh, this dignity should be extended to future generations as well. The problem is always that people think, and I call it, in a sense, the tyranny of the now. People think, yes, I want to be better off a little bit. I want to keep my standard of living and so on. But shouldn't we also take into account that future generations also would like to live 
uh, lead a life in dignity. Yeah? And I can more or less guarantee you that a life in dignity for 10 billion people under a four degrees or more scenario is impossible. So against that background, uh, working on that sort of modelling, does Australia's target, our target of, of a cut in emissions on 2,000 mm. levels of 5% by 2020, does that make any difference at all, have any impact at all? <laughs> it doesn't make any difference at all when it comes to global emissions for a while. But you see, I come from a country where the same debate has been uh, carried out for a while after Fukushima, the nuclear accident, Germany has now embarked on a radically changed energy policy uh, supported by 90% of the population. Compared to that, I think a lot of fuss is made here in Australia about a, I think, moderate, well-balanced package. Uh, so I was surprised to see in the headlines and so on this uh, very hot debate. The thing really is that this package, however it is designed, for the first time is creating a price signal. Eh? It means CO2 comes with a price label. And that is all important because it means it will instigate innovation in order to produce cleaner, to consume cleaner and so on. So it's the first step on a long, long journey. But if you don't make the first step, you will never end at your goal. Eh? And in Germany, we are a little bit further like that, but we are now looking for partners in our journey towards clean energy, and Australia would be a first-rate partner, actually. Well, I, I guess, though, that time is of the essence. Do you feel that with what you know about various programmes around the world now and the commitments that are already on the table, do you feel that four degrees is inevitable? Are you hopeful or optimistic that it can be averted? Mm -hmm. I'm optimistic. Oh, let's, let me put it in different terms. I'm realistic. And realistically, if you do the calculations, I'm a physicist by training. If you look at all the engineering options, we definitely can avoid four degrees. We can even hold the two degrees line. I'm deeply convinced about that. It's all a question about the politics, uh, whether the right framework conditions are being put in place. So I think that once you get an appetite for producing in a much smarter way, for example, saving energy, saving money, yeah? uh, less pollution and so on, then the process may self-accelerate, actually. Yeah? The French say, l'appétit vient en mangeant. The appetite comes when you start eating, and that's precisely what we hope will happen in Germany. It will happen in Australia. Actually, the key word is innovation in the end. If you have the right price signal, innovation will start in certain sectors and it will if infect later on the entire economy. At the same time, though, if we look at trading schemes that we do have, for example, in Europe, the European Union trading scheme, mm. many argue that that's actually not been very successful because while emissions have been reduced, it's more to do with economic conditions than anything else. It hasn't really, the scheme mm. hasn't really mm. done anything to accelerate that reduction. Mm. I mean, first of all, the scheme had teething problems, so to speak, some perverse effects. that has been remedied. We are going into a second phase and so on. Let's see. I think the system is set up in a good way. But I think, again, let me come back to Germany. I mean, we have come out of the economic crisis in a splendid way, really. We have growth rate of 4%, something unheard of before. We have almost full employment and so on, second largest exporter in the world and so on. And we still honour our pledge of 40% reductions of emissions by 2020. Quite to the contrary, a number of green jobs have been created. Companies like Siemens and so on, we are thriving. We believe that our economic competitiveness will increase through reducing pollution. So we see ourselves as the first member in a fitness club for the 21st century. A, a, a final very quick question, because we're out of time. But is there a point of no return here? Uh, it is a critical decade, not for physical reasons so much, but we can calculate if we want to hold the two degrees line. Eh? Beyond that, a, a number of very unpleasant ecological effects kick in. Then we have to reach globally the peak of emissions, CO2 and so on, before 2020. Later on, we could still clean up the atmosphere, things like that, but it would come at dramatic cost. So, if we are able to turn the tide before 2020, we will be all better off. Hans Joachim, Shellen Huber, many thanks for, for joining us tonight and giving us your analysis. Okay, you're welcome.